Greetings, Commanders, and welcome to episode 283 of Lave Radio, the show that talks about the universe or galaxy of Elite and the fantastic community that surrounds it. I'm your host, Chief Archivist of Lave Station, Commander Phoenix to Fire, otherwise known as Colin Ford. And joining me in the Orange Sidewinder Bar for this episode, we have our Deputy Trade Attaché, Commander Souverine. What up? We have our Inhuman Resources Director, Commander Shan. Hello. We have our unfortunate Head of Health and Safety, Commander Aid Levi, that's Ben Moss Woodward. Uh, give me a second, I, I might need to grind some beans, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, helping us out on tech tonight is, of course, our Chief Bar Steward, Grant Psychocal Wolcott. Hello. Hello. So if you wish, we you can join us live. We are hanging out in game in open. Are we at the Orange Side Rider Bar tonight or are we just sort of floating about in general? I'm in a completely separate galaxy this evening. Oh, you're in a completely separate galaxy this evening. You are being a traitor, I can see. I am. So uh, <laughs> at the moment, um, Cal is stuck in an asteroid field. And, but thankfully, uh, Commander <laughs> Ventura is, um, well, we, we have at least one nice little picture. <laughs> How much does that cost? One coin per play cow? It's about two pounds. I've got a shove in my slot. <laughs> yes. Toss a, toss a coin to your cow, O Valley of Plenty. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that song a little bit too catchy? It's just wrong. It's that catchy. <laughs> anyway, um, as nobody is flying around in Lave and somebody is, is just being an absolute turncoat, um, you if you can't join us at this, the Twitch chat channel, which you can access through laveradio.com slash live, uh, click on the live chat. Otherwise, you go to Twitch TV slash Lave Radio. So we'll quickly go around the, the crew, see how they've been for the week. Uh, we'll start with uh, Commander Souverine. Uh, I've been good, thanks. Um, right, this is my my weekly... Uh, I'm sc scrabbling to bring my calendar up so I can tell you what I've been doing for a week. Uh, what have I been doing? Um, I finally went to the uh, went to A and E to see whether well not A and E but some like they called it an urgent care center to see whether my leg was broken. Um, turns out it was not, um, and I'm just a massive hypochondriac, and it was completely fine. It's just quite cool. <laughs> um, uh, so, and then and then after and then pretty much as soon as I walked out the door, it started to get completely better. Um, so and then have I, you? So have you been self isolating for a leg? Uh, I always self isolate, Shan. I I live as if. I, I live as if coronavirus is around me all the time. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm fine again, and I've been running around the park again and all that kind of thing. Um, had a party at my uh, so it turned, we, we've become well, I've become very good friends with um, some neighbours of ours who live um, above us, and um, uh, we went to theirs for a party on Saturday night and we had a nineties night. Um, so were there any children? No, no, this is the fantastic thing. They are, they are the good group of people in their thirties. Um, they, so, so I'm trying to cultivate a little, a sort of, uh, a, a friendship circle made up entirely of interesting couples who don't have children and don't want them and still like doing things like drinking and swearing. Um, and these are definitely people like that. And it's, it's, it's just so brilliant. So we, so we, um, dance on the balcony to uh to lots of um to horrendous 90s songs um which is brilliant um and then sunday was uh was uh commensurately um morose and uh and then i've been um this week i've been working my little socks off and i've spend, been spending all day um scheduling web content and uh creating invoices and lots and lots of very tedious boring things um, which i'm actually still doing so i'm not in any galaxies anywhere sadly unlike unlike the rest of you well judging by the view screen at the moment none of us are in the elite dangerous galaxy <laughs> so what no are you doing in, no one's in, in world of warcraft <laughs> <laughs> what why guessing... do we bother with twitch like what why do we bother i don't understand <laughs> none of us are ever in game like we We've all this is the doing first time in a long time that I've not actually been an elite. And actually, the whole reason why I decided I want to come into this 
is because when I was here last time, I was able to walk around with a chuffing cup of coffee. And now <laughs> there's a beautiful bug in the game where my coffee machine is actually just dispelling coffee into nothing. So I'm, I'm, we're just going to quickly uh, go over to, to Ben then, because he's, as, as those of you who are following us on Twitch, they are, he's, he's not even in the Elite Dangerous Universe anymore. <laughs> it's, I, I'm just experiencing the joy that is the creative anarchism that is um, Star Citizen at the moment. You are just enjoying going to the toilet in Star Citizen. That is that is the hey. best way to describe what you're doing. But you, it's, a, it's a brilliant design of toilet. I mean, you, you press the button and your whole toilet swishes out and then your little toilet roll holder swishes out. Don't mention toilet yeah, roll around here at the moment. Is there any toilet roll in there? And though? there's even toilet roll in there. Um, I, actually, I have a feeling I know why my coffee machine doesn't have its mug. Because I ran away with, I, I was walking around the station with my mug the other day, and I've got a feeling my mug doesn't get automatically replaced. Right. Well, and I can't I mean, pick up one of these spare mugs. As Nopolis uh, says in chat, it is a functioning bathroom cow. If you're listening, <laughs> yeah, but there's no tiling. Yeah, it's just it's all plastic panels. There is a shower in here somewhere. Can't believe Star Citizen's bathrooms are finished quicker than cows. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, that's, there's a shower. There's a shower. <laughs> that, that doesn't look like a shower to me. <laughs> As my stream is very delayed compared to what I'm actually doing. There's a good, probably about a minute lag between what my stream's saying, showing, and what I'm doing. Hmm. Um, so yeah, that's what you've been up to this week, then. Pretty, uh, it's actually it's what I've been up to since Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, I've been the rest of the time. I have I have been an elite and doing things in elite. Um, mainly, I was just running missions and things like that again. Um, I've been in Red Dead Redemption. I've been in GTA. I've been in this. I've been playing some RimWorld. Um, yeah, stuff like that. I've been in, I've been in a plethora of, of universes. Right. Okay. Well, we'll leave you to to potter about with your your plumbing. Uh, <laughs> uh, Commander Shan, how have you been this week? Um, yeah, I've actually had a good week actually. Um, in game, I have been. Um, Engine, max engineering all my ships I don't ever fly and sort of have been stuck in the garage for months on end. Basically, any any alliance ship beginning with C, I think, is my was the ones I've been looking at. So that's what I've been doing in game. Out of game, I've actually I've actually had quite a productive week really. Um, I bought some uh, wheels and tires for my new car on eBay, uh, and they were about three hundred and fifty quid for wheels and tires. Mm -hmm. And they they were pretty much new everything. I mean, they had just been unwrapped basically. So the retail price for them, if you could buy them from Mercedes, uh, would be uh, near eighteen hundred pounds. So I saved Ooh. over. So I saved over fourteen hundred pounds on new from these wheels from these tires. Mm -hmm. uh, but and probably, has Mrs. Shan decided that you've now got fourteen hundred pounds spare to spend on things? No, no, no. She's very good like that. But actually, okay. they were collect they, they were collection only. So we drove down to Walton on Thames, uh, had a breakfast in a rather nice cafe at Walton on Thames, picked the wheels up, and then we had uh, a really fun day in Hampton Court and going around the maze and all stuff like that. So that's quite a productive day. And then on the way home, I had a genius idea on how to prevent cold callers, you know, people who want to uh, save your soul, pave your driveway, or sell you stuff. Mm -hmm. And the genius idea is very simple. You print out a sign that says, um, caution, self-isolating, and put it on the door. And no one comes around. Including the postman. Yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't matter, postman, but yeah. 
So we've had no cold callers since I put it up. We've had even had kids come around to muck around, you know, and mock and run, but they look at the notice and they run away without mocking. So yeah. yeah. Wow. So so there you go. We now have uh, a, a certain way to get rid of the Jehovah Witnesses. Well, you'd say that actually. The um, I was on a conference call earlier on in the week, and you know I have a somewhat uh, unjust reputation of being a bit um, mercenary. Mm-hmm. Well, well, the, the the people on the on this call were um, quite excited by the fact that um, with all these people who's going to be self-isolating, now is an excellent time to sell networks, networking solutions to all the people who would be homeworking. Yeah, isn't there a slight problem that we don't actually have the capacity for everybody to homework at once? Hmm. Hello? Well, well I, was about to, I was actually just about to say, actually, that since when does actually being able to, to deliver anything stop the salesman? <laughs> true. Very true. Um, okay. Um, Cal, how have you been for the last couple of weeks? Hello. I'm fine, actually. We're just a little bit, you know, concerned because although um, we're, we're due to have a meeting uh, next week down in uh, the good old of uh, Wimbledon and um, it looks like we're going to have to probably not um, have that yeah. meeting um, with the current circumstances and things. Um yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird thing because obviously you know it is a virus and and it isn't a particularly deadly, but the infection rate and the possibilities and then interactions with both Susie's medications and then if I was to bring it back and pass it on to move, it would have significant knock-on effects there, and it's just a risk not worth taking, um, which is a shame. <laughs> but elite me as well, you know, we're looking at all the changes in if you're running an event and the, the legalities of. All this stuff coming together, it's it's a bit of a freaking annoying time. Really frustrating. So it, uh, I've been keeping has, yes. one ear on that nonsense. Um, excuse the fan in the background, I'm going to turn it off. Alexa! Alexa! Because you've got to be Scottish. Turn off fan! There we go. Um, you can't do it in a Scottish accent, it doesn't understand you. It just ignores you. No. Stuck up cow. Right, um, so, uh, what else is there? I've been working on, uh, we, Moof has been working on the Artemis rig and lighting rig setups for ECM and for LaveCon this year, so he's currently building a structure for them, which is going to be amazing. Um, I've been working on the VR with the new uh, Vive Cosmos, which is brilliant. i um, been working on a retro setup. Um, as you can see, we I know Dave just recently invested in a big um, cabinet, RetroPie, using all that kind of system. So I was trying to follow suit with a four-player version, but a more desk mobile version that you plug into a telly. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's been going really well. In fact, let me just see. Can I can I call my camera up? Let's see. Does my camera come up? No, it doesn't come up. Um, and I'll show you what we've been working on. Um, yeah, that one there. Where's that one go? Where's it go? There, it's up there. Hello, everybody. Um, so, <laughs> we've been working on building this cabinet and stuff. It's not arrived. The hardware wood hasn't arrived yet. So, uh, in order to stop driving myself mad uh, with the control buttons being loose, we have here created this uh, beautiful uh, hardware um, that you can see here. Um, which has got the working joystick. If I hit start, you'll see that it will go live on the screen and I can rotate my little rocket and thrust. Oh, shit! I got hit by a rock here. <laughs> Never mind. Um, and we've created these. Now, if you want one of these custom controllers, it will work with Elite. Uh, you will be able to use uh, the various buttons in, and configure them <laughs> how you wish. Uh, we're not we're not sure we're quite ready to go into business yet. The other ones on the ground there, you can see a lot of the wires everywhere. Um, <laughs> it's been a ton of fun. It has been a ton of fun doing it. But we found a, a nice little program um, called uh, Recall Box. I've knocked my volume right up. There we go. It's called Recall Box, and it is mm. kind of like the um, RetroPie system as well. Um, but it's it's kind of using the select number of um, emulators and kind of keeping it simpler. Uh, so 
it's less easy to get into the nuts and bolts like RetroPie where you can get right down into the config files, mess around with them. You can still do that, but you don't need to as much and you hope that it works. Um, so far, uh, I'm being quite happy with it and we're currently just doing some nicety works on it and seeing what else we can do with it. But at the moment I was playing Asteroids, um, I've been doing some Robocopping, uh, uh, an Amiga emulator with Speedball, we're going to try and get a PlayStation emulator going on it, and then bring that down to uh, ECM and hook it into a screen and let people have some fun with it. Some four player fun with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, ninjas <laughs> or heroes or whatever the hell your particular rosy tinted glasses would have you believe. Yes, uh, Commander Kazian uh, at Twitch chat says, watch out Spider-Man games. The Psycho Cal Controller 9000 will earn definitely 2 million plus. <laughs> yeah, we can upgrade you from cardboard to triple layer cardboard, really secure. <laughs> Tri Hold that joystick triple ply. <laughs> Isn't that basically what Lego, well not Lego, what the Wii... Card Wii Cardboard or whatever the hell it's called. What did they call that nonsense anyway? Uh, yes, it's kind of similar. Yeah, that stuff. But it was I, the Google I, Cardboard, wasn't it? I made no. it myself. No, uh, Google Cardboard, you put your head, you put this in your head, you're going to get electrocuted. Yeah. Seriously, my wiring's not that good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know that, that cardboard stuff you make for your in Nintendo Switch? Oh, uh, I don't Labo, that. that's it. Apparel Wait. loves remembering, it's Labo. Labo, that was it, yeah. yeah. And I, mean, I have to admit, Labo actually looks quite good. Apart from the fact it's made out of cardboard and it costs about 100 quid. <laughs> it's expensive I saw you coming, cardboard. didn't I? Uh, but yeah, it's, it's I'm really, very, yeah. really been quite uh, enjoyed. It's really been quite fun. And um, you get, you know, with the previous setup there, you find out that the ROM you've got is from God knows the decades where you, you had to scroll your commands on Slate. Uh, and then you have to try and find a more up-to-date version or or find the files that will help and then sample files. Oh, it's a, you know, it's a usual kind of carry-on. And of course, you've got to own the ROMs because otherwise it would be a breach of copyright. Uh, and so oh, therefore you find that if you're looking for interesting ROMs, you're not going to get them from the UK because all those sites are shut down. I mean, honestly, it's, I don't know. I don't know quite what's going on with our... I mean, it's right to protect people's intellectual property, for sure. But when's the last frickin' time you saw an Asteroids machine in your local arcade? That is a very, very good point. They, they must have all worn out by now. Because it used to be Asteroids, it used to be Battlezone, it used to be Defender. And if you were lucky, you'd get Gorf and Space Invaders right next to it. Well, they did morph it into all in all-in-one... Uh, table, doesn't they? Where you can select what. Oh, we've got one of them at work. Game. Well, yeah. I mean, all the, yes, this is the thing. This this particular um, setup allows you to do the, exactly that. Build your cabinet, put a monitor underneath it, then and then you've got your table cabinet to be able to play it. You can put your four controls how you want. Um, you can build it if you want, and all you really need is a Raspberry Pi three at the bottom end of it, and mm. obviously suitable cooling for your Raspberry Pi because it's going to get a bit hot. And um, yes. other than that, it's it's an absolute joy to, to mess around with. And then all of a sudden, in fact, you know, let, let me just let me just blast you with some nice sounds from asteroids. So we'll get a coin in the slot. There we go. Um, so you get some. I'm not sure if that's good. There we go. There oh, Sea Wolf! Oh my goodness! I'm going back in time. That, oh. that doesn't sound very asteroid. No, oh, there you go. No, you got no. gauntlet. Is that oh, gauntlet is so good. Yeah, gauntlet's on this. So, I mean, you've got a whole pile of stuff that you, you find the resources and spend the time. Um, it takes a bit of work. Uh, but thanks to Mr. Vantian for all his help and advice uh, and helping get me through some real head bashing moments. And. Um, you know that way you've just reinstalled it and he tells you, have you tried pressing tab and going into the game control menu? You're like, you fucking... Mm. Ah, bah, ah, right back to the drawing board. Damn it, I've just reinstalled the goddamn thing and that's all that was wrong. Now I've got a new problem. And breathe. And breathe. Just as one of your um, little triangles explodes. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. Whew. I think I've managed to find the centre point here where nothing is going to hit me. Uh, which is awesome. I'm just going to leave it there and see how long <laughs> it says it this survive. big asteroid, <laughs> big asteroid comes oh, right no! into you right just then. Bugger. 
That was a double whammy. Okay, um, so that's been going on, and we're getting ready, obviously, excited about um, ECM and concerned about ECM as to whether mm. or not we'll be permitted. And, you know, it's just all these things are up in the air, and you just have to take it with an air of, let's see what happens, let's not rush into any decisions until we absolutely need to. And um, Yes. Yeah, that can be... One thing I have been quite yeah? impressed about, to be honest, about this whole thing is is how they seem to be following the science and the doctors rather than taking the American approach, which is, if you say it's fine, it will be. Ah, yes. Well, and I thought, for instance, this government didn't believe in experts. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because I, I follow a lot of forums and stuff. So the forums of people are full of people who don't listen to the experts, even though they said previously we should listen to experts. So it seems it seems it's okay to listen to ex experts as long as it agrees with your opinion. <laughs> yes. Um, is that like the, the guy, very much like the, the guy who went up at his own home, made a rocket to find out that the earth was flat and then died? <laughs> Those he win a Darwin Award. Kai, Kai, if you're listening to the show, dive in and correct Colin because you can do it far more passionately than I can. But he's a, he's a fan of, of flat Earth. Come on. No, but Kai actually did say some very nice things about the guy who went up in a steam rocket and died sadly. <sighs> Well, this wasn't the Jato solid fuel rocket guy he put on a car, was no, it? Was it? No. Oh, hello. Hi, Kai. So all, all I said of <clears throat> what, what, well, yeah, what, I, can... what I what I said was in 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 def in defense of the uh, flat Earth movement that uh, if if all of those people were to go ahead and build rockets and go up there, then my drive to work would be much less crowded. Hmm. So it wasn't Ty who was saying, you know, basically the guy was a daredevil first, and he jumped on the, the flat earth thing to try and basically to get money. Uh, that might have been. I don't know. I, I My whole thing was just that we should encourage all of the people that want to take themselves out of the gene pool to go ahead and do it because we're overcrowded as it is. Mm. <laughs> uh, well, there's a, there's a gentleman around here that um, he drives a red van with research flat earth on the side. Uh, also, uh, the back of his, his car is covered in confederacy flags. So, um, <laughs> Sorry. It, it like, kind of lends a, a, a bad image. So, so two uh, highly intellectual movements working together. <laughs> yeah, Lenin's actually raising a very good point. He was flattened by the earth. Um, but yeah, basically, in, in his in his defense, <laughs> he wanted to meet the flat earth. He did. He did. Yeah. In his defense, he was actually trying to validate his assumptions rather than assuming them and. His initial attempts had nothing to do with Flat Earth. It's just they were willing to go off and give him money, whereas obviously NASA is all part of them. <laughs> well, I, I'm not so sure about the Flat Earth thing, because if you look at Sol and Elite, and then put your head around <laughs> the monitor, it's still flat. It is flat in the field, of it. yeah, you're right. Shan, just, just stop. Just please stop. All right. Anyway. Uh, oh, well, what have I been up to for the last week? Well, for those of the those of you who are interested, the bunny is uh, is fine. He's had to be put on drugs. Well, alka uh, to keep the acid well, Actually, something pretty similar to it, because um, the uh, it turns out that once, once the poor rabbit has had one of these calcium overdoses uh that's it it's a condition that's lifelong uh, and that means that they have to get a, a pill every single day for the rest of their lives now which is isn't an absolute it, pain isn't it cheaper to get a new rabbit uh no <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay le that. legitimate question here colin mm -hmm. how easy is it to give 
bunny rabbits. Oh, um, oh shut up, Alexa. Uh, how easy is it to give bunny rabbits pills? Because I know dogs are fairly stupid and they're easy to give pills to. Cats, on the other hand, you're going to lose your life before you give the cat a bloody pill. Oh, it's, it's easy. You put it inside a little snack, like a like a piece of like carrot. Like a kale. No, not <laughs> kale. This does feel like a Bugs Bunny cartoon, doesn't it? You know, where the, the owner has to put a pill inside a carrot. Mm. Actually, actually I, I, does the rabbit now go, what's up, Doc, when you take it to the vet? Oh. No, but um, he's, I certainly he's certainly living up to his his thumping name at the moment because he's called Thumper. Surprisingly enough, um, basically every time he sees me, he goes, "Oh God, you're not coming anywhere near me again." Thumps and runs away. So you know, because he's obviously associated uh, associated me at going to the vet, which is mm. always nice. Um, so yes, that's there's, we've had that um, that little bunny incident, well, uh, but he's, he's at fine. Least you don't have to medicate it anally. <laughs> reminds, me, <laughs> reminds me of Alan every single time Alan we finished a, a live radio broadcast he said right I've got to go off and medicate the cat and that was mm. something along those oh. lines uh, yes so um, but in game um, I'm doing something a bit weird uh, as far as people here are concerned I'm doing not being blown up what? You're doing something weird. You're not being blown up. <laughs> I haven't been blown up for quite a while. Thank you very much. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so well, I'm I'm doing power play with my alternative. That commander. is weird. Uh, and uh, yes, so far. Well, are you I'm doing proper power play, or are you just open on open only power play? Um, that's what I consider proper, don't you? Well, if you're just picking up leaflets and dropping them off somewhere else, then well, that's how you start. That's... That I mean, that's how that's what I'm I'm discovering is that the, first of all, that's the the starting point where where you are you know getting the hang of it, and then after that, then you start getting involved with um, the various members of the uh, power play community uh, and finding out where we need to go to start. Um, undermining other people, which is a lot more fun than I was expecting. So, and, so, uh, so you're now a character out of The Incredibles? Un- undermining. The underminer. Uh, okay, yeah. Fair enough. The poor Link there, I think. Poor Link. But, uh, yes. And, so, uh, yeah. So, so far, so good. I mean, it, it's, I'm enjoying it because it's a change from blowing away Thargoid Scouts. And it's my alt, so I don't feel that that Im- important about it. So uh, I will be uh, carrying on with that for about a month and see what it's like after about a month. <coughs> so, um, with that exciting news out of the way, what we'll do is um, we have couple of um, interesting little bits that are happening uh, is development wise um, the first thing there is that um, will jumped on the uh, the big discussion that we were having last week about galnet and CGs and things like that and essentially uh, he sort of said that um, he said that Ben was right and Sue was wrong admit it oh God just shut up. <laughs> Right, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna mute him if he's gonna keep on you interrupting. But Ben, being all serious, you ruined the chance. You should have done a little dance and a gleeful sound when you did that. You didn't really milk your victory at all. I'm not gonna rub anyone's face in it. Thanks to change. No, I'm not you. That's what she said. Anyway. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Oh dear, I can't believe I sunk to that level. Again, that's what she... No, never mind. Um, yeah, uh, just to clarify, he's, he's going to said the usual thing that Galnet is never u- is not used for off-camera narratives anymore, and the only time you'll see stuff in, 
in Galnet will be for uh, you know things like when the fleet carriers arrive or whether or not there's new modules and things like that which will be uh, will be invoked he did actually clarify that the framework framework for community goals still exists uh, and although there won't be a regular amount of community goals so the weekly community goal will not be returning they will still see some community goals in the future Again, it does look like it's a case of no more interstellar initiatives. So, um, yeah, Ben, you you wanted to say something about that. I did, actually. I want to actually go off and thank Stephen uh, for getting in touch with me while he was on holiday. Uh, he was, over the weekend, he's been on holiday up in at a gaming convention and watching Glez Games. Um, and he actually got in touch with me over the holiday to do some of that clarification, which Will then went off and clarified the clarification. So, so I just want to thank Stephen basically for taking time out of holiday to respond to me. Hmm. So effectively, um, yeah, it, they're not dead, but basically they they do seem to have gone into status, stasis. But that's that's the thing. They, they they said no plans. It's it does feel like a cut feature, and um, yeah, I think someone's. Uh, you actually put this in the notes, Ben. You just said I think um, the fact that the off camera narratives being cut has annoyed people, uh, the lower story kind of people, off more about Galnet, while the general player base seemed to be more annoyed about the lack of CGs and the stellar initiatives. Is that about right? That's my personal take, yeah. I mean, I think you know, the likes of Drew, for example, and mm. very, very passionate about the lore, very passionate about the storyline and all that kind of stuff. And he ain't wrong. But 90% of the actual player base more want, I've got a CG and here's some easy money for me to go and get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I must admit, I have noticed how much everybody is sort of putting on the uh, uh, <laughs> the rose tinted spectacles about how good the CGs were. Yes. Have you noticed that? Oh God, yes, very much so. Yeah, but, because yeah. I and mean, that's basically that's what it comes down to what I was saying last week. Is like, you know, there was a while when we were actually suffering from CG burnout. I would say. Because there's like literally a new CG every week, and yeah, totally. Yeah, it's like oh, seriously. So what's what's the CG of the week? Okay, go here, deliver that. Don't really care why. And frankly, as I, again, as I said last week, Wotherspoon read the news, so we didn't have to. <laughs> so I'm, I personally, I don't think Frontier are wrong with what they've done. But I understand why people are passionate about it and they miss things that now that they don't now that they don't have them. Yeah. Well we've gone we went over that again and again last yeah, week. So exactly. let's let's leave that until they've got more news. Um however we did get a little bit of news with uh, Commander Bruce, otherwise well otherwise known as Commander he's not Australian though. He has to be Australian with a name he's, like Bruce. He's not Australian. Uh, a lot of people have been comparing him to Tom Welland, him of Superman or Smallville fame, which okay. I, I didn't see that myself, but, you know. Um, well, we got a bit of a Brucey bonus when someone trapped him uh, oh. on the... <laughs> hey, see what I did there? Yeah, we got a bit of a Brucey bonus when someone trapped him on the uh, when he was introduced in the live stream uh, last Thursday. Uh, someone asked about the uh, what he, how he thought the fleet carriers were doing, to which he sort of announced that the well, not announced that the new systems that came with them would change how we play the game, and that has got people really excited that it will be more than just a mobile space station. Um, is anybody else going oh goody to that? Well, the, my thought was was Bruce is still very new. <laughs> So would he actually know what was new or not in terms of 
actual gameplay mechanics. And that's no, that's no slight on Bruce, but you just knew. You just think, you know, if you were new to a game and you said, oh, you can do this and this and this, you would think, oh, that's great, that's fantastic, that's really adding something. But to an old wizened veteran, it might be, yeah, okay, I'll do that anyway. So I don't know, I'm taking it with, with a big pinch of salt. Uh, as I am, Suv. Um, I think, yeah, Shan's absolutely, absolutely right. I think his his phrasing was interesting. Um, it's going to really change how you guys play the game. Was um, was what struck me. Um, I think there are. The thing is that that still a, that still allows for a spectrum of possibilities. Um, it could be a suite of exciting new features and um, new ways to play the game. It could just mean you've now got something that's kind of mobile to put all of your ships in which would change the way we all play the game because we wouldn't need to only if you can afford one yeah it would yes but i mean i i think it's i think it's probably a little bit risky to 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 to, to leap on those words and think oh yeah this is going to be really transformative because what because because giving us giving us essentially a mega ship in which we can put all of our all of our spaceships and move it 500 light years per tick or whatever um that will dramatically change how we play the game because for those of us who have more than one ship we won't have to fanny about swapping them over and transferring them and and flying back to where to pick up our other one and all that sort of thing um i mean it's, it's not going to change the the game in a particularly interesting way or and it and it doesn't it doesn't it does not going to introduce any exciting new features but that would be uh changing the way we play the game so i, I so i think we probably ought to be slightly circumspect about how much excitement we pin on his words yeah i will say it is kind of telling that um we kind of reined in our enthusiasm about the whole thing at the moment in time and uh as as i watch cal lose his his little thing to a centipede again were we ever were we ever the target market for fleet cap though well actually i think we were because basically we're the, the, the Fleet carriers are for the veteran players. They, they, they for the people who have, have run out of other things to do. I mean, for goodness sake, you if you had said to me a month ago, right, in order um, to to carry on playing this game, you're going to try power play, uh, I would have just laughed at you. Yeah, that's try. true. No. For those for, for those of for, the, for those of you who are in the DDF, um, was the idea I, I always think of um fleet carriers as being a departure from the original vision of elite dangerous um and i always think that people like michael brooks and david braben if you'd asked them five years ago whether players should have capital ships they'd say no that's not part of the spirit of the game it's about you versus the universe you know it's a cockpit simulator not a not a giant asset ownership thing well i, um, I so i guess my question is like is that correct or for those of you who are in the ddf and are a bit closer to this stuff like you know, was capital ship ownership sort of on the cards back in 2012, yes. 2013? Interesting. Yeah, you had, um, a, there was a promise made in the Kickstarter that they had plans to give you um, executive control of a massive ship. Huh, cool. Uh, okay, that, that's completely changed my, my outlook on it. Uh, um, that, was, that was in right from uh, the beginning. I mean, it's been... Uh, <laughs> That kind of thing, that kind of claim, has been bashed about the forums every time someone mentions, um, uh, oh, what do you call it? The, uh, uh, you know, when you you bought the the whole big package in advance. Oh, I can't believe I've forgotten this after the amount of our, our lifetime arguing. expansion pass. That's it. Every time the <laughs> lifetime expansion pass is mentioned in the forums, people come up with a whole list of what was promised, and that is one of the things that was promised. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, well, was, at least it's part of the original vision then, which um, which I felt has been sorely lacking in the last couple of years. Um, so that's quite exciting. Yeah. Sham? Yeah, I was I was going to say the fleet carriers. Um, I think what has exacerbated or, or given demand for fleet carriers is the sheer amount of money and credits in the game now. Because... Once you've brought your A-rated cutter, which is mm -hmm. you know, 1.4 billion or whatever it is, once you've got two or three billion, then you're never going to need to worry about rebuys. You're never going to worry about another ship. And so you, all you're then doing is for credits, just watching numbers go up. 
So therefore, you need something which is a, uh, not what's a credit sink, but you need something for players to spend the money on. Yeah, that brings back an element of prestige because when you, when we first started the game when it first launched, the anaconda was seen as the unattainable ship, and that was the real status symbol. Oh, you got an anaconda! Now you can get an anaconda within two or three hours. So I, I think there was that need, that need to have something for players to do uh, mm. with their money. Yeah, completely. I mean, we. I think when they said that the void opals were put in by design. I had suspected that the reason that the Void Opals were there at that level was basically so we could afford the fleet carriers. And the problem is, is that has unbalanced, the, in my opinion, it's unbalanced the game. But um, it, it, it all depends on who you ask, because some people say, oh, no, they, they've given you the, uh, the easy mining so that you can get into the ships and ignore the beginning of the game. And I find that that's probably a bit of a shame because maybe I'm just being a, a, an old fart on this one, but um, the move from Sidewinder up to Cobra, I found probably the most enjoyable. And then once it gets past the Cobra, then it's sort of, it, ooh, it, it kind of, the, the progression slows down a lot and you feel to, I feel that you lose something, but I'm beginning to get off topic there. So, <laughs> Yeah. Um, so my my other question regarding fleet carriers is based on what Bruce said, if it can be taken at face value, that is, is will there not be a riot and assault storm on the forum for people who cannot afford or do not have the prerequisites to buy a fleet carrier, and they will then I don't call it pay to win, but there will be a complaint that balance has been lost in some way. Ugh, no, no. Like video games put expensive things into them all the time. Like when 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 the Corvette and Cutter were put in, nobody's that those are both expensive and um, difficult to obtain because you've got to get the rank for them. Nobody whined that it was elitist um, or that it, <laughs> it left out newbie players. Like no, it, it even if they're very expensive, it'll be fine. It depends on what they bring because. There is still a hell of a lot of difference in between a f- you know, between under ten million basically, and over over one billion. And I know people are suspecting maybe even twenty billion. It will, yeah, it will be far less difference. than twenty billion because one of our at Slag Eye, one of our, I was thought it would be twenty billion, and um, one of our guys at Slag Eye emailed Frontier Support and yeah. said, "Hi, I've heard it's going to be twenty billion. Is that true?" And Frontier Support replied saying lol no it's not going to be anywhere near that which to me says less than two billion no that's uh, that's too cheap oh Wait. man you says the guy with the most money in the game only <laughs> so, something like only seven percent of players have more than a billion honestly like i'm not one of them like i'm certainly not one of them i know but we, we've all got we've, we've all got like two thousand hours in the game or something like m- m- most um and exactly, not all of us. Not all of us are in those numbers. Um, I have just about two billion, um, and I've got something like six weeks of cumulative play in the game. Like Frontier probably view their average player as having about a hundred hours in the game. I would have well, I was thinking from a logical point of view because if you can max out a cutter for say one point four billion, then that means you get a full capital ship size vessel that can store cutters in it. But only six hundred k more, and that just doesn't seem to equate. I agree. I agree with you. I, I, tot- I totally agree. I don't think it will be. I don't. I don't think giving. I. I, I agree with you that, that a, a piece of uh, technology the size of a town um, or a city ought to be more expensive. I don't think it will be. No. <laughs> I mean, what I would hope for them to be would be. I'd hope they start around eight billion. To buy the um, the main hull, but then, or they start out cheaper, let's say five billion, and then as you build up, you buy add-ons, just like you do with all the other ships, because the hull cost of an anaconda is relatively cheap compared to its capabilities. But it's only then when you start adding the modules on does the cost ramp up. 
I and agree. That, yeah. I, and that I think would be a good model for fleet carriers. I mean, they'll think well, about it in terms of hours of play needed to get. Um, I mean, if considering what they've what they've smacked with the banhammer and what uh, and or what they've nerfed and what they haven't, a um, hundred million credits an hour seems to be about the threshold at which they view something a uh, uh, a nerfable exploit. Um, and you know, how many hours of play do they expect to lock fleet fleet carriers behind? That's that's the way to think about it. Um, they they won't they won't put something in the game that takes a hundred. Um, or you know, 500 hours to get because they don't. They don't. I, I would. I wouldn't have thought they'd expect most players to play that long. They probably expect most players to play for an average of I don't know, 100 hours or something like that. So, so I would have thought that they would lock them behind 100 hours of, of gameplay. Hmm. Well, um, well, we'll just move on from there for the moment. Uh, one thing that has been noted in the forums is that a hoax announcement of fleet carriers being delayed until Q4. Uh, due to um, COVID-19, uh, has been debunked by Will. Um, I must admit, this was looked very a, a good mock-up, uh, and I, I was taken in a little bit until I realised, nah, that, they wouldn't do that again. But it has caused a little bit of salt on the forums and going around the, um, uh, the various people who have passed it around. Uh, the... the Hawks announcement, not COVID nineteen. I just should point that out. So uh, yeah, um, as far <laughs> as we know, it's still Q two that uh, these things will be coming, and that, and they haven't changed their mind about that just yet. Has anybody else seen that? By the way, not me. No. Okay. Fair enough. Right. Well, moving on, there is uh, one bit more of Frontier news. Um, it does seem that they have just announced today that they have the Formula One license. Uh, Frontier are to develop and publish management games annually for from the Formula One World Championship. Uh, Frontier is pleased to confirm the signing of two other Frontier publishing deals, uh, taking the number of deals to five for the company's third-party publishing initiative. Ooh, so what are these other deals then? They're going to be they, they're going to be other games from indie. Um, that well, I, we we oh. still have that unannounced but well-known worldwide existing IP. Well, I'd, I'd say that the Formula I, One is a worldwide no Apparently, IP. the F1 thing isn't that. Oh, where right. did you get that from? I think I've got it. I think I know what it is. Oh, so it's the Thomas the Tank Engine World Building Simulator. No, no, I think, I think, because it explains where Sandro has gone for all these months. I think it's the sequel to the it's Star the Gen Wars. It's the Gin Simulator. Star. No, it's a, it's a sequel to the Star Wars dance game that Sandro did. No, hang on. Sandro's been on record to deny <laughs> that he had anything to do with that because people were accusing him of creating the Han Solo dance and he has refused uh, on several occasions that he was not responsible for that. To be honest though, Colin, if you were Sandro and you were responsible for that, would you admit <laughs> it? <laughs> Why, would you admit to being a lizard? <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> so, um, right. So, obviously, a, a management game based on Formula One. So, do you think it's going to be a case of you you do the man team management and then you're allowed to drive around in a simulator, or is it just going to be the management side? I don't know because Formula One is such a hard thing to to do. I mean. Because it's it, there are people who will just sort of like want to drive the cars around, but then you have the real purists, a bit like the flight sim crowd, where if you get the feel of the car wrong or the data isn't right or something like that, it's going to take a hit. Now, where Planet Zoo and Planet Coaster work is they're quite obviously they're nothing to do with real life. They're made up zoos and made up theme parks. But this is Formula One. And Formula One is a sport that's driven by science and driven by numbers and driven by metrics. And if it's not right, 
it could really flop. Uh, I don't know. Like the, 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 they visited zoos and stuff. They co- they consulted with with zoologists and conservationists to make Planet Zoo. The animals. One thing that's frequently said about it is that the animals are very. Um, yeah, but it's blatantly made up with the, this formula what do you mean, blatantly one. Made up? They're real animals. They're not what, real animals. What I'm saying is that they they have form in doing quite sort of toothsome, complex simulations that draw that that have a lot going on under the hood and they are pretty good at um at sticking to uh at making things plausible and and with a real life degree it was well, sort of you know a, a simulated degree of real life complexity um as they demonstrated with planet zoo i i, I think planet zoo is an example of why they might be good at this as opposed to why they might why I, I, one of one of my um old friends at university used to design components for formula one cars for several teams mm-hmm. so he's in he knows his Formula One, and he has uh, he's never brought a Formula One game at all because he, he will try the demo and he will go, this isn't right. And it doesn't matter how accurate it's reported to be, it won't be right for the people who really know the sport. So, so yeah. most of the potential customers for the game won't be Formula One engineers. But this is where this is my concern is because there are enough fans who will know. It's like the flight sim crowd. As I say, if you get a flight sim, if if it if you get something like um, DCS, now DCS is incredibly complex and incredibly detailed, and people who fly DCS praise its accuracy, but it's not pretending to be a game; it's a simulator. So it either has to be an arcade version version of Formula One, or it has to be the full simulator. It can't try and be both. Well, I mean, we do know that when it comes to physics-based games, they are quite good at this kind of thing. Otherwise, Planet Coaster wouldn't work as well as it does. Uh, and, well, management games, they've got them down to a T. Um, I mean... <laughs> But the, the, I think the main thing, I mean, I know where you're coming th- from, Sean, because some of the electric testing that we used to do for the car plants obviously went over onto uh, some of the Formula One stuff as well. And their standards were incredibly high. Uh, and you know that those people will, will, will basically able to tell if they've got it right or not. But I have to agree with Suv, the average person who's going to, to get this, I don't think needs needs that level of detail down to the you know the nut being turned into the the right amount of times, if you know what I mean. I guess we'll see what it's like. And the other issue, or not a question I've got and it was brought up in the chat, is regarding how much does this license cost Frontier? Because I I, I know uh, from other hobbies I do, for example, um, making scale models. Um, Tamiya have stopped making models of Ferraris and Porsches and stuff because every time they make a model, they have to pay Ferrari or Porsche or someone a license fee, and it's it's made it uneconomic to make the to make the model kit. So but Formula One is a global license. It, it literally is the world's biggest money sink. Mm. So. I don't know how much a license is, is going to cost Frontier, but we, it, they have to make sure it pays for itself. Yeah, I mean, that is... Well, I don't know. I mean, if it, if you were... Uh, EA pay for FIFA and um, uh, and uh, Madden, now that's going to cost a lot, but they're still able to put out a game, a reasonably good... Well, it's a reskin, I think, but they, they do add more to it every year. They, they, you know, they put it out a, a lot more, even though they do pay the license. And it, obviously, because there's a new version every year, it must it must pay the bills. So, I mean, surely Formula One would be able to do it. Uh, no one goes into Formula One to make money unless you're a driver. It's just a huge money sink. Well, they're not actually starting off their own team. They are just creating a management simulation of a team so <laughs> i think that the word management is um is key they didn't say f1 simulator they said management game 
four management games even. But is it going to be like FIFA, but with cars? You know, like the football manager. I've got no idea. Cars. I've never played it. Do you never play football manager? I really am not interested in sports. Skiing, uh, I like skiing, but I, I like sports that you can do on your own that, that, um, that, don't, that aren't competitive. So generally things like football pass me by. Ben, do you want to jump in there? I think one thing that's interesting about this right is that Frontier have also got the streaming rights to it and whatever the hell that means. The st- what, the streaming rights to their own game or the streaming rights to the actual Formula that's, One? The wording's funny even on that, isn't it? Hmm. Because, I mean, the wording, says, it just says, and sh- including streaming rights, and it's like, okay, what the hell? Can you imagine it if they're, they're doing sort of their own no. virtual F1? Would that be eSports? Yeah, Witherspoon's just put in eSports. Yeah. They've got streaming rights to the eSports of that game. Which would imply it's more than just a management sim, because with all the yeah, best world, driving as well. At, oh. because all the best one was, so watching someone fill in a spreadsheet isn't the most gripping stream you can do. Hey, tell that to all the Eve players out there. <laughs> yeah, but Eve also has the pretties. So, I mean, okay, what non... What pretties could be added that isn't you driving your car around, but maybe isn't as thrilling as watching cars drive around in a circle for 10 hours? The thing is, I I don't I'm not um, I've never played I don't play sports games and I don't play many management and, games. I'm not expert at speculating. Uh, on and that. I don't I watch that, F1, so I, yeah. I'm not in a position to comment really either. But I would have thought that it, the the phrasing of management indicates that there's there's going to be um, that it's not going to be heavily simulation cockpit based or whatever the equivalent is in a Formula One car. Um, I think the, it is actually um, called a cockpit. Excellent, um, but um, but. Anything else sounds really dull, doesn't it? Like, there's got to be some player agency. I can't imagine. I can't imagine that the the races will be just. You know, I can imagine there's a strategy element in kitting out the car and 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 hiring the crew and all that sort of thing. But then, if the races are just watching your watching your decision decisions res, um, resolve over a period of minutes as the cars race around, that sounds dull as hell, doesn't it? Yeah, you're, you're also good good. Point. You're also going to have to work out what the strategy is. How many times you you change, you you bring your driver in to change the tyres and and refuel and things like that. They they can have a massive effect on the actual the yeah, actual do, game. Do, do, yeah, are those decisions I, made during the race? Yes. Well, that could be, I, I guess that could um, it, it, so it could be like a I can imagine that working if you're making decisions in real time while the cars are, are going around. So yeah, about following the like, driving line and things like that. I think a cheaper license for them to buy and that would actually make a better game would be buying the license to scale electric. <laughs> <laughs> you're, back to your, you're back to your Thomas, the tank engine simulator. You just want something on tracks. It wouldn't well, surprise no, me if they, if they did something like one of the job simulators. It, w- it really wouldn't surprise me if Frontier did something like s- something in the mold of Farming Simulator 19 or, or Euro Truck Simulator. You know what? They, they need to do Game Developer Simulator. Yeah, I mean those games have they've sold something That's like already five been done. and four million, respectively. Like but those, those games have very, very respectable sales. They sell more than Frontier's games, I think. Um, it, and and Frontier are about the best place UK studio to make games like that. It really wouldn't surprise me if in if one of the the IP the IPs that they announce next is a job simulator. Yeah, someone has now said F one fuel rats confirmed. <laughs> That's Commander Lenin. Well done, Commander Lennon. We're still looking for our winner of Twitch today, so uh, get get in your suggestions. <laughs> well, the advantage about a scale electric sim is you could have like a number of lives, and you'd lose a life every time you had to get up and pick the car up and put it back on the track, and things like that. <sighs> well, we're going to move away from the world of F1 now, and then back into the galaxy of Elite. Um, we've got a couple of in-game events which have been happening. Uh, the usual updates about Operation IDA or IDA. Um, they have successfully repaired Titan's daughter. 
Uh, so that's the prettiest station in the in the bubble, uh, and that, uh, they are now focusing on fixing Exodus Point in the Hade Sector AB dash W B two dash two system. So uh, that's the their latest target, uh, and then. Uh, the anti-Xeno initiative, uh, uh, or anti-Xeno activity in general, again, the Eagle Eye network is quiet, and there have been no sneaky incursions by the Thargoids in the meantime. Um, scouts and interceptors continue to plague the Pleiades and the Witch Head Nebula as usual. So um, if you want to shoot a couple, feel free. Uh, in the newsletter this week, well, the, in the store update this week, we had new skins for the Clipper and the Anaconda. I must admit, I was a bit impressed with the Clipper ones, uh, so I might be tempted to get one of those. Anybody else had a, a chance to see those? Oh, do not they yet. not appeal anymore? I didn't even know it had a newsletter. Well, there's not really a newsletter. They're more like store updates. You get a newsletter one week and a store update the next. Oh, I, might, I think I might have opted out of those accidentally. Any anything for content? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's just it's just to make you look pretty. <sighs> so what we'll do is we will uh, take an advert break and then we will come back with our usual main whiffling discussion. We will try and keep it on point. Natural remedies have always been some of the galaxy's finest, so when we discovered a wholly natural way of slimming down and reducing your appetite, we had to share it with everyone. Harnessing the amazing powers of our native parasitic life, we've solved an age-old problem. Vega Slimweed has been used by settlers of the region for decades with undeniable results and significant health benefits. If you think that Vega Slimweed could be the solution you're looking for, Speak to your doctor today. Travelling with Vegas Slimweed Ingestive may constitute smuggling. Please check before your journey and declare yourself at customs for an internal search. Failure to digest does not constitute grounds for reimbursement. Side effects may include but are not limited to increased blood pressure and heart rate, insomnia, nervousness, blurred vision, restlessness or headache. Some forms of parasite may cause stomach side effects like constipation, dry mouth, nausea or vomiting. A small sample of patients exhibit full body paralysis, catatonic state and internal hemorrhaging. Parasite must be purged before pupation, else death will occur. Eddie Lee Wise here. Our family-run business looks after all your sartorial needs. Whether you need something to turn your pink python purple, or you want to wrap your buns up in a nice tight flight suit, Millsburn Ken can sort you right out. He's an expert at inside leg, and my wife Barb's is a whiz with a sewing machine. Bespoke tarting for you and your ship. Visit Eddie and Sons. Plus me daughters at Lave Station. Right, sir. Cough, please. <coughs> oh, boy, space is cold in here. That commander has a cheek sitting up in his cosy and warm cockpit while we haul radioactives around his cargo bay. Oh, is it cold? I hadn't noticed. Oh, that's right. Why, you're not even shivering. Maybe it's because I picked up this North Coast cargo bay sweater. It keeps me warm and stylish. Say, so, that is a nice jumper. It's made from the finest Verex wool and handcrafted by novitiates in the underground monasteries of Van Manen's Star. Wow. Where can I get one? New North Coast Cargo Bay sweaters. Be the envy of your friends. Wow every lady from here to the Empire. Be warm and toasty even on the tenth planet of a dying star. Now on sale at Spark and Mensa. Better now? Better? Why? I feel so warm, I'll probably never catch man flu again. Spark and Mensa, because nothing says sexy like a neck high jumper. We buy any ship, bar none. We buy any ship, bar none. Any model, any colour, any shape, any size. We buy any ship, bar none. We here at We Buy Any Ship, bar none are ready to take your excess space travel vehicles off your hands. No more negotiating with dodgy space station vendors. We'll simply give you an estimated quote online, then, when you get here, we'll point out all the little dints and scratches that make the price get smaller and smaller before we actually give you any money. And the beauty is, we take any ship. We buy any ship. Bar none. Terms and conditions apply. 
We buy any ship, excludes trading in any of the following vehicles. Adder, Anaconda, Asp, Boa, Cobra, Constrictor, Cruisers, Eagle, Falcon, Gecko, Griffin, Gear, Harris, Harrier, Hawk, Kestrel, Crate, Lanners, Lifters, Lions, Mantis, Merlin, Moray, Osprey, Panther, Puma, Python, Saker, Sidewinder, Skeet, Spar, Stowmaster, Tearsel, Tiger, Transporter, Turner, Viper, Wyvern, or any Imperial or Thargoid vessels. And welcome back. Now, uh, one of the things that we were uh, going to cover this week is um, obviously with the 2020 update, uh, one of the rumored features is the um, is the much hoped for um, space legs, or as as we prefer to call it, elite feet. Um, and we were wondering, uh, looking at other games that do this kind of uh, hybrid model. How elite is going to how is going to manage it, and how how do you think it would compare against these other games? Um, so, I mean, obviously, there are quite a few to uh, to look at. So, we'll start with um, who's actually played No Man's Sky. What do you think elite can use from No Man's Sky that would that could apply to the to the elite feat? I've played No Man's Sky quite a bit. Um, I think um, uh, No Man's Sky gets quite a lot of things right. Uh, they, the jetpack function on No Man's Sky is really, really good. Um, it doesn't have, No Man's Sky has no kind of EVA type activity. Um, I think if you EVA, you die. Um, uh, you can walk around space stations and stuff, but they, they have sort of gravity, ge gravity generators, um, we assume. Uh, the, um, in fact, there isn't really the, the only the only sort of walk around that you do in space is um, is on your freighter, which uh, which which you which, as I said, doesn't have EVA and and, um, and behaves just like a base, um, as in like you you don't access the exterior of it. Uh, so I don't think I don't think that elite. I mean, there's not many things. I think elite elite should. There are lessons to be learned from No Man's Sky in terms of well, there there are meta lessons obviously in terms of. Or not to over promise but there are also like gameplay lessons in terms of sort of um there are things to learn there about like how to how to create interesting um beautiful planets with a limited tool set and um procedural generation um but i don't think space legs is something that elite really needs to can, can get a lot from no man's sky because because the, the, there's not a lot of crossover there elite elite doesn't have atmospheric landings yet so elites um elite's space legs is going to be entirely space station and um, spaceship based or maybe maybe um, airless worlds um, and um, and no man's sky has has artificial gravity so so I, I don't think there's a massive amount of crossover yes I mean I'll play a reasonable about no man's sky but the key one of the key differences is that in no man's sky you are either on foot or you're in your ship there's no SRV to kind of complicate things because if you look at the activities you do on foot in No Man's Sky, you know, you um, gather materials, you shoot things, etc. I, I hate to point this out, Shan, they've added buggies to No Man's Sky. They do have the equivalent. Oh, okay. oh we have quite a um, <laughs> um, um, Dude, they added um, those years ago. They added them like three or four years ago. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> my, my point is, my, my my point is, is you can't really compare the two because one of my fears for it, uh, space legs and elite, is there is no difference between what you can do in a buggy and what you can do walking around, and the only difference is is the camera point of view. Oh no, there's there's a there's a big difference, like um, in two ways. One, um. One speed, uh, which is non-negligible because it, it it affects your perception of distance and your 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 perception of how large the game world is, um, and how accessible gameplay things are to you, um, and how and how populated the world seems in terms of things to do and see. Um, and two, um, in term, in terms of force multipl multiplication, um, you can you can mine you you can do x on foot you can do x times 10 when you're in a car you know it likes like arc survival evolved you can you can mine you, you can collect x number of berries on foot but if you're on a on a parasaur you can or on a whatever the 
the, the dinosaurs that are very good at collecting berries are, you can collect 10 times that number. So I, I think the vehicles, vehicles play a useful role in games as force multipliers um, and ways to kind of step change your ability to, uh, to um, achieve your goals in the game. If right. Any sense. Oh, no, no. Shan, um, do you want to come back there? Um, I, I worry for space like an elite, as I say, it needs to be. If, it, if it's on a planet, then there has to be enough difference between the two. And I'm not sure being a, a buggy is just a quicker way of gathering stuff is sufficiently exciting. Not for me personally, anyway. Because if a buggy's quicker at getting stuff, I'll just stay in the buggy. I won't ever leave it. So it needs to be something different and unique. Um, and to be honest, I felt a little bit like that in No Man's Sky. And yes, I didn't have a buggy in there. But if I wanted to explore, I would zoom around in the spaceship. And then I'd land if I saw something useful, interesting. I wouldn't go on foot. Go on foot. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I can see the the actual walking around ships and um, doing repairs on your ship using space legs as 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 useful, but we don't have that kind of thing in. Well, we do in No Man's Sky, but we don't actually have it EVAing while you're out in space. You've got to land and repair your ship on on the ground, so to speak. But. Um, yeah, I, I mean, obviously the big one which uh, people are going to compare Elite to is the one that uh, Ben's cheating uh, on us with at the moment, and that's Star Citizen. So, Ben, you're playing it at the moment. How does it feel? It feels a hell of a lot better than it did when I played it back in... Oh, whatever the the last one a, a good couple of years ago was. Um, I mean, I'm now I'm flying over a, a beautiful snowy city with a lovely sun going down over a over a mountain and things like that, and it looks gorgeous. On the other hand, as people who have been watching my stream have seen, there are so many bugs; it's ridiculous. I mean, we think Frontier, we think Elite Dangerous comes out with bugs. This is. <laughs> it's just bug central, uh, and so, some of them are laughable, like your coffee not going into a cup. Others are serious, like a train will be in the station when you have to get into the get in a train, and then the train will clip through the train that's already there, open the doors, you get on one of the trains. And then the train will leave, but leave you standing on the train that's been sitting in the station all along, so you can't actually get out of the spaceport to hand in a mission. And if you don't hand in your mission in time, then you, you know, then you go off and you fail. So that's kind of a big deal if things like that fail. Um... I also think Elite does something very right in that it gives you the option to get everything from your cockpit. Um, the immersion of being able to essentially walk along to the local Amazon box to collect a delivery, to fly it somewhere else, to drop it off, it is very, it's very good in your immersion, and that's awesome. But, my God, it gets old very quickly as well. You know, whereas obviously in Elite you can just say hand in mission, hand in mission, hand in mission, and not have to go off and spend ten minutes trying to find the uh, the bloody Amazon box. Um, and yeah, one thing I've seen in Star Citizen, and admittedly this was a long time ago, uh -huh. um, was if you wanted to load your ship with cargo, you had to sort of pick the box up and put it in yourself for each. Yeah, oh, cargo. Not, Is that not, not with so. You have what I what I'm essentially thinking of as data delivery missions in Elite, and these are these things where you go off and it's basically you're doing an an Amazon packaging delivery, and it's not actually taking up any cargo space in your ship. You basically you pick up this box, you dump it in the hold somewhere. It well you you dump it in your ship anywhere, 
um, including on top of the coffee machine if you want. And then the... But you you still got, like, your 10 tons of cargo space that you had to fill up with titanium or diamonds or whatever you want. So that's why I consider them data del- like the data delivery missions in Elite. But essentially, you're being an, a- an Amazon delivery driver. I'll just jump in very quickly. There's a yep. couple of things. Um, one, the the bugs and stuff. That isn't, th- this is this is apologism of the highest order. And I, uh, I'm sorry for that in advance. But mm. we should bear in mind that it's... You're not alpha. being a white knight, Suv. I am slightly like just re- <laughs> remember it's an alpha. It's it, there's a different um, there's a there's a different design for philosophy. Yeah. Uh, to elite, they are um, they have given players access to the alpha um, that wouldn't normally happen. They're populating it with oh, features. They have to because otherwise they'd have been dead a long time ago. To- totally agree. Yeah, they're they're populating it with all the features. Um, regardless of how nicely they play together, um, and then we'll start worrying about the bugs and stuff once that's done. Um, Elite didn't do that. They put a, a few of the features in in 2014 for release and have ostensibly been working on adding the rest of the features, i.e. space legs and atmospheric landings ever since. Yeah. So, they, they, you know, take the bugs with a pinch of salt. It is an alpha. Um, two, the um, uh, the people often say, um, oh, you know, screw space legs. I don't want to move my own cargo around by hand. Um, I think that there's I think there's a there's a sense there's a there's a sort of de- there's a clever way to do that. Like. If you have a sidewinder, you have four tons of cargo. Um, there is, it would be awesome as a new player if you do a bit of trading in your sidewinder and you and you have to move those cargo units yourself. It will take you like maximum a minute. It won't be bad gameplay. Um, it will emphasize the fact that you're the bottom of the pecking order, um, and um, uh, and it will be a great way to sort of demonstrate that these ships are real physical spaces. Um, obviously, by the time you're in a Python or or a or a type a type seven or a type nine or something, the, the auto loaders will do it for you. Um, I think that, I, I think, you know, people always Would say, you that, oh, God, the auto loader to do it for you. Why not? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Fuel, fuel, for example, fuel is a cost in elite dangerous. It's a, it is a negligible cost. It's, it's literally there for realism. There's no gameplay impact to the cost of fuel in elite dangerous. Um, there's no reason that the auto loaders couldn't have a similar negligible, but realistic or not realistic, but like, you know, immersion, um, creating cost, as just something nominal to reflect the fact that a service is being um, it's being tendered. Um, the um, I don't think when people say like, oh god, imagine moving seven hundred and forty tons of biofuel by hand. Like, yeah, that would be boring as hell. Um, I mm-hmm. it would be I'd be amazed if that's the implementation that makes it into the game. You don't. I mean, Star Citizen doesn't have that at the moment. If you do what we would call bulk trading, that gets loaded into your ship. Um. I've not done. I've, I've only been play. I only played Star. I've only played Star Citizen since the, since Saturday, so I've not done a lot in it at all. Uh, but one thing that I have done in it was multi-crew mining, and my God, what a what a great experience that was! Uh, not only was it actually meaningful multiplayer con- content. But it was actually meaningful mining as well, uh, and we were working together as a crew to mine stuff, to coordinate all of our, to coordinate everything, to coordinate what we're picking up, to identify the right rocks, and it was actually working together as a group of three of us to to do this mining job quickly and efficiently, and I thought that that was so much better than mining in Elite, whether it's deep core mining, which is basically it's all about the pretty booms, basically, or um, mining just with your lasers, which is find the right rock with a prospector, hit the, mi- hit the, hit the lasers, scoop up the goods, and head, hand it in. This was actual real gameplay, real multi-crew, and it, and it actually made real money as well. Um, so I thought that was a, it was such a good experience, um, and the same actually. I felt that the the multi crew combat that we did, where you had one person in a turret, sorry, one person in the in the pilot seat, and then again we had two people in turrets, and you know how in Elite you've got the turret and you're kind of like this weird 
floaty outside the, the, the ship. yeah the third person view thing yeah and it's it's a bit weird mm. whereas star citizen actually gives what we all actually want you're in the bloody turrets of the millennium falcon and it's freaking amazing yeah they they've really they've really modeled it on it's, it's very... um, yeah um and i'm i'm sorry elite but we all want the, to be in the turrets of the millennium falcon not this weird ass third person view yeah, I think I think we can all agree that because that was the one thing when the gunnery view came out in Elite Dangerous, everyone went, what? what? Yeah. I mean, am I wrong? No, you're not. You are very no, not definitely. wrong. Um, definitely not. And the other thing that I like, and I understand why Elite has done this, but your actual people on an actual ship with everything that that entails, including the trolling, trolling abilities, um, as opposed to these holograms sitting in someone's chair oh, controlling everything Oh, ben, ben, you are not... That, I think that is unfair. You know that the, the reason for these so-called holograms or telepresence is just a gameplay thing. I, I appreciate it's, that. No, I just you don't, don't agree with it. I don't agree with there you go. There you go. I mean, how are you supposed to actually get people going from one ship to another? Have them meet up in station? It would yes. never be it would never be used. We we see people It would never out, be used in a so side how, galaxy how many, this size. How many times do we see people outside of Lave Station when there is nothing more to do than hang around? How many times does That's only because we are there. Yeah. But okay, so how many times does EIC have commanders coming in to load their ships? Well, I you... don't know, but from my personal experience, it's a very, very solitary experience. I don't see many people about. Yeah. I don't, and very, 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 very rarely do I wing up with people. Now that might be because I'm I'm more of a lone wolf, but the the main point that I got is that I see so few commanders. And they're not, I'm hardly going to say to them, okay, um, do you fancy going away to another station where we meet up and then I'll jump on your ship? People would just not use the feature. Uh, I, I, got, I, I, disagree. I disagree. Playing Star Citizen, you, working, working around spatial requirements to, to, yeah, to but multiply. Star like, Citizen it's, it's, is only one system at the moment. Yeah, Star Citizen is only one system. You've got a lot of people in the same place. That's true. Elite Dangerous... New, no, we're spread out over an entire galaxy, and mm, that's I, I, my point. I, I'd still prefer it. I'd still much um, prefer it. Have to plan around it. Yeah, I think I have no issues planning around it. I have no issues saying, right, Colin, I'll meet you at the station, and we can all jump in my cutter. I don't yeah. want to play with you. Shut off. <laughs> that's fine. I don't want to play with you. Steve, I'll see you in my cutter, and we'll go do some mining, mate. Done. Let's do it. All right. So, <laughs> so I mean, yeah. <laughs> But we can all agree that the turret functionality uh, in Star Citizen really makes the multi-crew work. Um, yeah, Mr. Whiskey Richard is saying, with meaningful multi-crew gameplay, I think people would be fine having to physically get in someone else's ship. Yeah, multi totally. Multi-crew is pretty lacking in game gameplay-wise, in his opinion. Yeah, I think I think most I think most people think that. Um, th th I think that. Um, it would be quite brave to take away the the beaming other people in remotely. Um, I, I think it would be considering that some people would would say that they wouldn't want it. I think Frontier would the safest option would be to leave that option. But I, I would much prefer it if they took it away because um, it, it 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 reinforces the size of the galaxy. It reinforces the the fact that um, that space is big, and if if somebody's on the other side of the galaxy, they really are very way um we we already plan like elite is not a drop in and out game it, it's you know wh whenever i meet up with anyone it normally involves half an hour of buggering about getting to the, getting in the right ship and getting to the right system i don't i don't think it would be that different from the the game we already have if you had to co if you had to coordinate to getting on people's ships also the oh, act of, God, the, act of the act of getting on somebody else's ship is I mean, what's the point of being able to walk around them if you if if there's no gameplay reason to actually approach it from the outside, lower the lower the boarding ramp, walk up into it, go through all the the, the all the cabins and stuff? Like it, you know, Space Legs lends itself to the requirement of 
physically climbing out of your ship and getting into somebody else's. That I, I would love that that sequence. It would be it would be really really good. Yeah. Well, um, Commander Kazian has made the point. I mean, it's not the problem is that the distance between people is a lot more. I mean, admittedly, multi crew is not being used anyway at the moment. Yeah, even though it's easy. Even though it's a lot easier to use. And I think one of the reasons because that is is because we're so used to first person and everything, and then all of a sudden to use the gunner, you're already in third person. It kind of throws you out. It it kind of breaks the immersion to that point. See, I thought the reason for having the viewpoint for the gunner in Elite Multi Crew was the camera is a little drone that flies around the ship. So you're looking at it from a drone's point of view, not the gunners. Oh, I, ironically, when you look at some of the more what the, the new advanced fighters, the F-35 and the F-22, they can create those kind of views for the pilot on the fly even now. So um, <laughs> you, you yeah, basically but... look through your sh- you look through your airplane in the same kind of way that that gunner turret works in in Elite Dangerous. But it's not the Millennium Falcon, and people want the Millennium Falcon gun turrets. Well, I don't know. The other question I have regarding games and Elite V is, do we have a game? I guess No Man's Sky may be the closest, but one of my concerns about Elite V is that Frontier will abandon VR as a gaming experience for Elite V. Mm. That that the effort they put into VR for the rest of the game, that will be one of the sacrifices they make in order to get the game out on time. Yeah, be, as somebody could be. as somebody who only plays in VR, I would pay that price willingly. What you would not have VR for Elite. Yeah, game. yeah, I would. Um, if, if they said, if they said, right, we're going to roll Horizons and and Elite Dangerous 1.0 in together. So that's the base game now. And and the new update is called Feet. And it's 40 quid and it's got walking. Um, by the way, it's not VR. Um, you could either have your base game, which is everything up to now, or you could have Elite Feet and um, and take the hit and not not have VR. I, I, I would I would definitely take that. Not everybody would, but um, but those of us who signed, those of us who liked what was what was offered in the kits in the Kickstarter, or what they said they would work towards in the Kickstarter, would um, would probably do it. I think. But then with VR, you see, it becomes very complex when it comes to what what walking mechanic do you use in VR? Oh, not not really. Like, I, 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 we've we've, we've left we've left Mac out slightly. Um, I, I just want to. Go, I want to wheel back slightly and um, and just read out some really good comments that Mac Winston's made. Um, so I'm just going to touch on multi crew briefly and then then back onto onto VR. So first of all, Mac says that um, this is Mac Winston or Mark Winston um, that oh, yeah. uh, mining <laughs> mining and elite is um, is multi crew mining and elite is is uh, given short thrift and it's actually extremely fun. And he and his pals have, have had some really really good times uh, mining mapped asteroids. Um, in multi crew, um, and um, also that um, uh, he also says, um, hold on a sec. Uh, he also says, um, multi crew is great for getting noobs into combat as well. Um, so my final point on multi crew is that I think one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest design problems with it, um, and the, one of the reasons it's the take up is is not great is that the um, there's no credit transfer between players and the split is isn't the split five percent to whoever you've got in multi crew in with you it depends on it depends on your um your rating and their rating it can range from five percent up to sixty percent sixty percent sixty six six zero yes they get sixty percent of what you get yes yeah okay. if, if, you, if you are basically elite and he's elite then yes but if uh, the pilot is elite and the uh, gunner is harmless they get something like five percent yeah see see that's not um i think that's a that's a bit of a um i think i think that is going to uh, dissuade people from using it because people you know it, wh- why why would you why why would you deprioritize your own advancement just to just i mean you know frontier again making us choose between game progression and having fun um 
so so i think i think for me that's one the reason that the, the fact that you can't just both earn the same amount and achieve well, your while i would ag- fun, i so. would agree with you as long as when you um when the pilot of the ship's destroyed the gunner and the 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 other crew have to contribute to the to the rebuy but at the moment they don't they get away scot free interesting it's, it's, yeah well that that, ought, that probably ought to be fixed as it's well it's absolutely free money which yeah, is okay. why they they put that 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 thing in the first place we've had this argument before because wings basically you get the same money because you're risking your ship even though you've got different rankings yeah but yeah. if you're in multi crew and you're you're a crewman you've got no risk whatsoever yeah fair enough i'd i'd probably i'd probably rather it was you share the risk and reward yeah. it's quite say. ironic that everybody is is kicked up a fuss about the the different rewards when basically you can have your fun and then off you go mining and and it, money credits don't matter <laughs> yeah um but but wheeling back to to um vr mac as uh, has just commented in our um in our show chat that um he doesn't actually think VR would be that much extra development. Um, and um, uh, judging by how other games treat it, it does seem to be the kind of thing that um, that isn't beyond the wit of man to bolt on after the after a game is released. Um, and um, the other thing is that w- when people talk about the, lo- the, mo- the locomotion challenges in um, in Elite, I-, I think that's true. But other games surmount this. So you've got. Um, uh, no Man's Sky, for example, has a, a really, really fantastic VR implementation, um, and you have loads of movement options. Because the thing is, the nausea thing with VR is a is a is a spectrum. Like some people get really nauseous in it, and some people are totally fine. Um, luckily, I'm I'm okay, and um, I don't. I really I'm perfectly happy to use the thumbsticks on the hand controllers as um, for movement, the same way that you do with the gamepad, um, and they, it works brilliantly. There is absolutely no reason that um, that the elite couldn't include normal locomotion with with wasd or a or a little stick um and and a lot of players to be perfectly fine with that and also you know it, it, it's not too difficult to build to build in like the sort of teleportation mechanic like um like a lot of games have as well pavlov vr is another one that that has a gamut of of movement options and um and handles it really well and that's the that's a shooting game yeah, I mean, uh, I've seen the No Man's Sky in action now for for VR. It does, it does seem to handle moving about quite nicely. Um, it's not like you need an omnidirectional treadmill to be able to run around a planet. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, I, I feel like I feel like the nausea thing is true. Like some people do get nauseous, but it it's not everybody. And Max just said that he has an iron stomach. I, I'm I'm exactly the same. Like. You know, I, I think that we're we're overblowing the challenge of locomotion in VR. Just just treat it the same as any other game. Just just bind it to a stick or WASD, and then give everybody a teleport, and then offer a teleportation option. Just in and case some people get, <laughs> just in case some people get nauseous. Well, actually, one thing that um, people have found is that um, I mean, I'm, I'm I think that. Uh, Cal might be able to back me up on this. Is it's the distance between um, your pupils that needs to be aligned properly with the headset, and if it's out by a certain percentage, it's a very small percentage, then that was that is a major contributor to the nausea. So I mean, you can go to your optician and ask what is the distance between my pupils which they get nervous about because they think that then you're going to have that because that's what you need if you want to go and get a, a, a cheap pair of glasses from the states <laughs> uh but yeah the, normally if you if you get that 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 distance and then apply it to your headset how i've got no idea because i'm not an expert but it's supposed to cut down a nausea you've got a little dial on most of the headsets that will allow your um, distance between your eyes and mm. the, there's, I think the biggest, because it's refresh rate and stuff like that, uh, with the new Cosmos, that refresh rate is next to nothing. But the problem is that now now you're getting into the realms of where your focal point is really critical. I know that mm-hmm. coming soon is going to be the eye tracking, which will track the focus point to your pupils, which is great. But getting your headset fitted properly and getting your eyes right into the sweet spot to get the beautiful um crisp picture 
definitely makes a huge difference to the longevity of your uh, session. Um, although I find the Cosmos headset is the most uncomfortable one out of a lot of them yet. And it's one of the nicest experiences in VR. Um, stunningly good in VR. Uh, but again, if you're down at ECM or down at LaveCon, you can have a look for yourself. Um, they've brought a new one, the Cosmos Elite, and what they seem to have done is gone, well, the Cosmos was good, but it wasn't good enough, so what we're going to do is use all of our technology, and we're going to bring back the lighthouses, and you're going, well, why would you bring back something? Oh. Anyway, I'm not quite sure what other advantages are there to that one yet, but I'll figure it out. But at the moment, um, I'm very impressed with that, but yes, the your focal point and getting your eyes set up is, is your challenge. Um, you can get a good feel for it anyway within about two minutes of, of, of trying one out to realise that it doesn't quite sit right in that you can tweak it. But you can spend forever tweaking it and then you work out actually it's not quite sitting in your head so you adjust your headset and then you go, ah oh, crap, now all the settings are out again you go back <coughs> round. And round and round you go. So once you find it, it's, it's why it's difficult to sh demo these things as well is because if you customise it to yourself the next person coming along goes, that's rubbish. Right, uh, we're going to have to actually quickly go through some of the rest of them, otherwise we're going to run out of time for uh, for our, our community corner stuff. Um, who here has played Pulsar The Last Colony? I have. I, think I love Pulsar, too. it's brilliant. Yep, uh, basically that is... Uh, that is a, what would what you describe that, uh, walking around your spaceship and managing bridge crew at the same time. Yeah, it's. I, I think it's. Um, it's kind of. Uh, I, I describe it as Star Trek Bridge Crew crossed with Morrowind. <laughs> yeah, the the, the actual uh, character mor uh, ca character models aren't aren't the best, but they're pretty rudimentary. I mean, it's got the same. You know, if anybody's played Morrowind, it's it's all um, sort of stick men. Uh, the, the 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 NPCs are just stick figures who stand there and and don't move, and all the. All the all the the conversations are in text boxes, and, and they're pretty good. Like there's loads and loads of depth of depth of chat and stuff, but it's all it's all text. And Pulsar is it feels exactly like that. Like, the, the, there's loads of NPCs, one, well, not wondering about, um, sort of standing around in space stations and stuff, and they've all got branching text trees. So it's a bit like going back to 2001 for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, obviously. I mean, me and Cal, we've we've played some Pulsar together as a as a crew. Oh, ben, good, have yeah. you joined in those? Group? Yeah, I've joined in Pulsar. I love Pulsar; it's so much fun. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, the the multi crew in it, I love. What it lacks uh, and, uh, <laughs> in its prettiness, mm -hmm. it gains from its flexibility. Yeah, yeah. I agree. So you gone? Sorry. It, basically, I mean, obviously, do you see that working around the big ships? You see, as uh, the live radio crew crewing an anaconda in the same way, would an destroy anaconda. it. Yeah, well, or in a sidewind, not a sidewinder, but in a cobra for that matter. No, it, why can't why can't you run to the back of the cobra, hit the engine with a wrench, and get me an extra five percent hull? I can't see it happening really. The, the, the opportunity was there with multi crew. Um, I, I, it would, it would, yeah, it, it would require such, the wind, didn't they? It, it would require such a huge redesign of multi crew, and it would require a lot of. It would be taking quite a lot of functionality away from the pilot seat as well. Well, perhaps that's what the 2020 update is all about, where they are re, re engineering multi crew to handle this kind of thing. That would be pretty cool. Well, that's. Yeah, that's that's what a lot of people got. We can live in hope. Yeah, it is different though. Like the, the, the Pulsar is fundamentally very different. The pilot's job in Pulsar is like there are five crew members in Pulsar, and the pilot is only one of them. And mm -hmm. the pilot is um is in charge of navigation as well as um as well as flying the ship. And uh, is that is that right, or is the is there a uh, oh, the captain command? goes off and says where to go to executive command? Yeah, but yeah. I guess the, I guess my point in Pulsar is that. Like there are five crew members, and the pilot is is one of them. Like piloting the piloting the spacecraft, as in like the thrill of space flight, is only twenty percent of Pulsar. The the captain's job is nothing about flying a spaceship. The scientist's job is nothing about flying a spaceship. The weapons person's job is nothing about flying a spaceship. The engineer's job, you know. So I guess it, it it's a very different game because because the, the thrill of dogfighting or whatever is only ever going to be twenty percent of the appeal. And elite is fully built around being in the cockpit, being a hundred percent of the appeal. So I don't think 
I think that I don't think you can make Elite five times bigger, and I don't think that you'd want to strip functionality away from the cockpit because I, I think that that would be too dramatic a change. So I can't see, um, I can't see them going as far as Pulsar. Um, and also, Pulsar really is quite a lot like Bridge Crew. It's the same, you know, it, it, you're 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 working together to to operate a very large machine, whereas Elite is very much you and your ship, it, like in beautiful symbiosis kind of thing. Yeah, the thing about Bridge Crew, just very quickly, is it's designed from the ground up to be mm-hmm. multiplayer and multi crew. It's not tacked on, and I think multi crew, etc., in Elite is very much tag, tacked on. It's almost like an afterthought, which is why you have a limited amount of functionality to do compared to Red. Just remember Planet Side 2. What, what's so special about Planet Side 2? Because I've never played it. I've just heard about it, but I don't know Yamix goes on about it. Well, it's basically an FPS game set in on planet obviously so it's 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 if if the rumors are correct and speculations are correct the people said um elite feet is going to be almost like a battle royale kind of thing um it won't it won't just be exploring there'll be a battle royale or fps element to it how come as soon as someone said elite feet people have just jumped on the the battle royale um bandwagon I, I just cannot see. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not going to go down there because I'll just end up ranting, and it's too late, and I'll wake people up and get shouted at. So, um, yes. I mean, the other games that we've got on our, our list for comparisons are Starfighter Inc. Does that have a first-person point um. to it? Starfighter Inc., for whatever reason, has a... Before you even get into your spaceship, you've got to mi- navigate your way through the sh- through the mothership that you're in and mm-hmm. do a whole load of customization and things like that, all in zero-G. And then you've got to sort of open up the door and get into your spaceship before you can even do anything. And you no idea. There's, I've not seen any real gameplay in it, but it is in there, and it's how you basically control and customize and configure your spaceship cool. by floating around your hangar and doing stuff. Right. Don't know why, but it is. Uh, so d- d- you say it's CQC with the Newtonian that's physics. What, that's what that's what Starfighter Inc. is basically like. All right. It's, they've um, renamed it into the bl- in the black now, and they they've renamed it in the black. And I mean, David Westman's all about the story and things like that. It's still in there, but the games it's failed to get Kickstarter once. I think the second one was a lot lower, and it managed that. But and the game they've got an alpha out, but it's okay. development's quite slow on that. Right on the subject of slow development we've got dual universe as well i haven't been following that one at all dual universe is um i've, I've followed it a bit it it's uh it's very minecraft uh it's so it's another game that so it it's a little bit like eve in that the economy is going to be completely and totally player driven um the devs won't will will just very barely umpire it um and it'll be players building their own cities and corporations and states and all that sort of thing and and it's very ambitious like they they, they sort of want to see entire player player run nations and that kind of thing um every single object everything every single artificial object in the game will be created by players so spaceships buildings cities um vehicles that kind of thing uh you'll be able to you'll be able to patent stuff um like you know, create your own blueprints and sell them um create your own create your own components and sell them so it'll be a bit minecraft a bit eve a bit um no man's sky the um it, it is it is physics but i guess it's i guess it's kind of if you've played uh if you've what's it called space engineers it, it's sort of a bit more like that so it's not so much the sensation of speed you know the 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 visceral thrill of dogfighting in space it's a bit more like Ooh, you know, I I built this. I, I it's, it's more the Lego thrill than it is the Elite Dangerous thrill. Um, right. 
and um so uh so it's it, it's it's less um but but again like the the ability to um the ability to walk around is um like i think um i think the it'll have like a I don't, I'm not sure how much procedural generation will be in it, but it will have a quite a large universe with, with planets and stuff to, to land on seamlessly, which will have atmospheres and things. So there will be lots and lots of beautiful, um, beautiful space to explore. Um, so presumably uh, being being able to get out and walk around will be will be really good fun, even if the flight model is not as sophisticated. Would you want it to be something like Space Engineers, you know, almost like a survival game, like Ark in Space or something? Do you want the survival game type? Hmm. Interesting. I, I mean, um, Star Citizen are introducing. Sl well, I mean, it's not survival elements. They're basically they're basically introducing a buff debuff system with food and drink. So um, you can eat certain things to to buff a few stats before taking on a certain mission, or, or if you if you eat or drink other things, they, they give you little debuffs. So it's not a it's not a survival system. It's, it's um, much more much more gentle than that. Um, I do like I like survival systems in that they give use to objects in the game. Um, and uh and they they i like them when they're when they're gentle like no man's sky is now quite a gentle survival system it's very difficult to it, it, it's nearly impossible to to die of running out of sodium or whatever because they they've they've made it so much easier um but i like the fact that it's there because it it means that the world seems a little bit more everything just seems a bit more meaningful um mm -hmm. i wouldn't mind it at all if elite dangerous had survival stuff i'm not sure i'd want to i'm not sure i'd want to watch a food and drink meter but i'd certainly like to manage an oxygen meter and things like that for for eva and um um and maybe like maybe make it a bit more scientific like a hydration uh you know sort of making sure that you're um making sure that you're you're adequately equipped to to venture into certain um certain atmospheres and, um, and all that sort of thing Okay, um, Ben, See, this, is would... be, but this is going to be the last point because we're going to have to move on. Um, what were you wanting to bring in at, about survival well, systems? So I'm just taking it out of the space genre for a second. Red Dead Redemption does survival systems in that you're, you're, it's going with realism and you're, you're basically you're crafting your own tonics and things like that. And you guys all know how I feel about crafting. The flight model is um, so bad in Red Dead Redemption. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can't jump off a bridge without dying, but yeah. Um, <laughs> but I appreciate the way that you go off and, say for sake of argument, you, you smoke a cigarette, and that gives you more focus, essentially. Um, See, I would want to expand that system. Uh, I would want to be able to grow onion head or insert drug here. And sell, them. <laughs> and, and, and sell them to players, which then had an effect on how the game looked to them on screen. So for Onion Head, you can be get drunk. Um, and they do a very nice thing with when you get drunk, it actually changes the text on your menus. So instead of saying have a drink, it's like have a something. Mm. Well, leaving that. I've Aside, leaving cowboys and Indians aside, um, we will go on to, to, to cops and robbers a bit. I mean, what do you think about this idea of having boarding parties where you have one boarding party attacking another ship in a boarding party and having I that would kind of never dock again? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean, basically, your ship has been disabled and then you've got to fight off boarders. Yeah, brilliant. Sounds good. Sounds really good. Until it happens to you. <laughs> so, so long as they make it more like GTA in terms of consequences, I don't mind. Yeah, um, just to cram and I think the, ga the awesome. gameplay would be amazing. The gameplay would also be, you know, you're busy trying to just go off and do some trading, and yeah, all of a sudden a true. certain individual comes up on you, disables your engines, and you're then fighting corridor to corridor, and all you're trying to do is deliver your mugs. <laughs> um, that yeah, would be yeah. very, very frustrating. But if you can get over that, and I'm saying this is somebody who probably couldn't get over that, <laughs> the gameplay would be brilliant. And I, I think you could you could go and do things to 
to make their job harder. So, for example, you could you could line your corridors with auto turrets or something. You mean turn into a tower defense game? Yeah. Oh, great. So we've gone from first-person shooters to tower defense. Right. Uh, <laughs> let's let's draw a line under that at the moment. There are the games that we could have used for an example, but um, we're not going to have time to cover them right now. So we'll just quickly go through some things that have been happening in the community lately. Um, so the Orion Expedition has left Waypoint 9, Waypoint Skylab. Uh, they're continuing to travel through the conflux in a southwesterly direction. Stars, planets and moons have been found a map. Discoveries abound. Spirits are high and the galaxy beckons them forward and onwards. Um, who's following the Orion Expedition? Commander Yannick is sending me periodic updates. Ah, I right. Think, does that does that count as following? Yeah, yeah, that'll do. So you know, as you know, they they're they're nine waypoints so far. I don't even know how many waypoints they've got. But um, uh, right on, Commander. Keep it up. Uh, on the subject of expeditions, the um, Loose Screws podcast, or as we like to call them, Hillbilly Banjo Radio. Um, they have their own expedition, and we've got Kai. <laughs> we've got Kai in the chat. He's going to kill me for that one. Um, they're Very uh, justified. <laughs> Distant screws is in progress at the moment, uh, with Ty and company all heading to Colonia and deeper. So um, tune into the Loose Screws podcast later in the week for to see how they're doing. Um, we've got. Hutton Orbital's Operation Hot Mess. That's continuing, but Grant, is it true that um, Hutton Orbital truckers have a slight infrastructure problem at the moment? <laughs> yes, there's no mugs coming out of the production line at this time. <laughs> is that because Hutton Orbital is self isolated? <laughs> I'm not quite. No, it's Brexit. It's always Brexit. There's no mugs because of Brexit. Um, well, you have to have something to uh, to do while you're counting your toilet rolls. So maybe that's why there isn't any. Is that where they've all gone? Um, it does seem that, uh, that uh, there's been an infrastructure failure at Alpha Centauri, which has disabled the buy area of the commodities market, and therefore mugs cannot be bought. They urgently need food and machinery products delivered to try and end this state. Power generators and water purifiers are also in demand. Um, I must admit, this is the first time I've heard of a um, infrastructure failure BGS state actually hitting. So it would be for the truckers, wouldn't it? Is it has it hit Hutton Orbital itself? Yes. Oh God. Oh. So they're they're asking for people in medium ships to travel all the way out there with food and machinery products. Well, that sounds a lot like a CG to me. <laughs> well, one that doesn't give any money. But <laughs> no. So with that comment, Sue, do we think it's a subtle CG arranged by Frontier? <laughs> <laughs> like a yeah, CG. yeah, yeah. You wanted narrative? You've got fucking narrative. <laughs> um, in other news, we have to send our congratulations to the Fuel Rats. They have just reached 70,000 rescues. I just let that that figure sink in for a moment. Seventy thousand commanders out there have forgotten fuel at some point. I wonder how many of those are Chris Hankey. I was going to say, and how, how many of us have actually? So I will hold my hand up and say I've used. The... Is there anyone else? I've never used the fuel rats. Never used the fuel rats. I've never had to. Because I got a fuel scoop. Uh, one, one, one time when I was out exploring Guardians, I forgot my fuel scoop, <laughs> and then realised, oh shit, what have I gone and done? Was it good? Um, was it fun gameplay? Like having, you know, having having to call them and then wait for them and that kind of thing. Well, um, I, mean, I, I guess my point was, did did you did you go to bed thinking like that was an awesome in interaction, that was that was super good fun, or did you go to bed thinking that was a uh, an out an immersion breaking? It wasn't emotion breaking. Um, 
I don't... Okay, this is going to sound critical, and I'm not critical of the fuel rats because they do an awesome job. I would have liked it if my rats had stuck to hung around and talk and things like that. It was very much a drop in, here's your fuel, and then bugger off again. Yeah, okay. So, ben, or anyone on the like, uh, radio crew, if you run out of fuel, you don't need the fuel rats, okay? Just give me a message, and I will come. <laughs> <and rest. laughs> yeah, I'd rather give Flossie a message, thank you very much. Okay, uh, moving on uh, quickly, uh, we have also Down to Earth Astronomy that is doing a mining march in the 2020 guide. Okay, I'll, I'll translate my bad show notes there. Down to Earth Astronomy has done a video on mining in 2020. Um, and. Yeah, he's basically saying if you go and follow my guide, you can make two hundred million credits, um, and he's he's not technically wrong. Um, it's just a bit clickbaity as well, though. But it's basically he did say one thing which I'd never learnt about, which is you are best to use when you're selling. You want to sell. Let's say you've got two hundred tons of painite. You want to sell. You want to sell somewhere that has a demand of over two thousand tons, uh, right. and that way you'll get the full value for your your stuff. Um, so you it's use the tools appropriately. Keep your eye on the update, obviously. And he was recommending maybe using low temperature diamonds, which are more of a stable commodity. Than void, um, than void opals and the likes. Yeah. Okay, um, there is a Dear Stephen, a video from Hurley. What's what's that about? <laughs> it's a troll video, basically. That's, oh, right, if it's um, a troll video, we'll leave it. it isn't, it's not a troll troll video. It's like, you know how Stephen was doing his... Do, uh, he basically panicked when he got interdicted by an NPC mm -hmm. and then failed at running away and things like that. Yep. And... Uh, this guy, Hurley's gone off and done a video highlighting where he went wrong, what he could have done right. But it's a bit... It, it, it's done in a semi... It, it's done in a fashion that made me chuckle. Mm -hmm. um, and the suggested really, really good beginner combat build that he suggested for Steven is Terrabad. Right. Um, which I again found really, really funny. Right. Um, also, this week uh, we've had Drew talking about the Salome event, which happened three years ago. Now, normally we'd we'd like to to touch on this, and we'll probably come back to it say next week. Unfortunately, we've kind of run out of time uh, tonight. So, if it's okay with everybody else, I'd like to park that and come back to it next week. Fine, buddy. Okay. Um, well, it's been going on for three years, so I don't think anything we say is going to add anything new to the conversation. No. no. Um, but, so moving on from the community things, we have got an, a community question for you all, uh, which we thought would be quite um, interesting. Um, we're going to ignore the salty replies to this question, so if you're going to be sarky or, or sassy, we're just going to ignore you, but if you could write one story for Galnet, what would that hell headline be? <laughs> That's going to be the uh, the community question for this week. Um, uh, this is probably inspired by the breaking news thread which has been happening on the forums. Uh, so, uh, we'll we'll give out the the contact details at the end end of the show. Uh, now, before I go to the shout outs, has anybody got any final business they'd like to bring up? Oh, I thought you were asking us for our story ideas. No, I was asking. It's a, it's a community question, Shan. Well, I was going to say I know, but I was going to suggest mine, but. Oh, well. oh, no, okay. If you've got one to, to start the ball rolling, let's hear it. It can't be salty or sassy, though. I don't know about sassy, but it would be um, David Braben held hostage in SDC sector. Uh, 
Okay, starting off high then. Really going for the. Uh, yeah. Well, I thought I'd get Ben's mind of where. I think we'll just ban Ben from entering, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, so if nobody's got any other business, um, we'll give some shout-outs. We've got our sister station, Hutton Orbital Radio, which broadcasts on a Thursday at half past eight GMT. You can tune in at tv.forthemog.com or if you just want the audio, radio.forthemog.com. Follow the discerning commander that likes a bit of CQC action. Check out the CQC Discord at discord.me slash elite dangerous CQC, all one word. Uh, following this, I do believe we have a fantastic Galnet news as provided by the iridescent Commander Witherspoon. I'm hoping we do, because I just said yep, so. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, excellent. Wonderful. Good to see. wonder what he's come up with this week. <laughs> so um we'd like to thank everybody who's chipped in on the Twitch chat and uh uh, thanks for all your contributions and company tonight uh, but that is it for another episode of Lave Radio if you'd like to get in touch with the show you can email info at laveradio.com hit us up at facebook.com slash laveradio tweet us at laveradio uh, you can join our discord server by going to discord.io slash laveradio we also have a TeamSpeak server, which is shared with the Hutton Orbital Truckers, where commanders come to hang out and chat, which you can find at teamspeak.laveradio.com. Do get in touch if you have any questions or if there's anything you'd like us to discuss in the future, or even to answer the community question. Uh, so, Live Radio is recorded live on a Tuesday evening at half past eight GMT and streamed out at laveradio.com slash live. So, thanks to Ben, thanks to Silverine, thanks to Shan, and uh, thanks, of course, to uh, PsychoCal for doing the tech. Uh, but until next time, Commanders, fly safe. And if you can't do that, fly dangerous. News Digest, 10th of March, 3306. We read the news so you don't have to. In this week's news, Hot Mess Halted by Hutton Hardware. Braben in SDC Sex Dungeon Hell. Senator Dox's Assassin. The Bathroom Update. Hot Mess Halted by Hutton Hardware. The infrastructure supporting the Hutton Truckers inspired mission to supply a mug to every station in the galaxy and thus defeat the terrible disease known as MODS has been halted by the failure of infrastructure at Hutton Orbital. 
The metal presses that convert scrap frame shift drives into handy beverage containers that keep your drink hot and fend off mug ownership deficiency syndrome fell silent following a series of mechanical failures believed to have been caused by running the presses round the clock to keep up with demand. Quality control experts reported that the latest batch of mugs were deficient in several important respects, having not only had their handles fitted upside down and the Hutton logo inverted, but also having the hole at the wrong end. Operation Hot Mess, the Mug Every Single Station initiative, which reached the milestone of 75%, more than 41,000 of all stations successfully mugged on Monday evening, will now take a back seat as the Hutton truckers, fuel rats and others rush replacement machinery to Aldin Prospect and Hutton Orbital to try to get those mug presses running once again. Raben in SDC Sex Dungeon Hell. Uncle Braben, the children's entertainer, has described how he was locked up in a Soho basement by a particularly lively group of young ruffians and pelted with sausage shaped balloons filled with water. It's believed that the ne'er-do-wells were trying to coax the elderly entertainer, replete with his sad face, red nose, wig, baggy trousers and oversized shoes, to give some hint about what they might be getting from him for Christmas. And they for some reason believed that assaulting the clown would persuade him to open up. Uncle Braben was rescued after several hours by a crack team of negotiators led by Will Flanagan, who, possibly inadvertently, persuaded the hooligans to throw the water-filled balloons at them instead, allowing Uncle Braben to sneak out through the back door. Flanagan's rescue team, which includes Stephen Benedetti and Bruce Garrido, is still believed to be working hard to keep the youthful gang of protesters occupied. Their location is being tracked by the distant screams of We have no plans to restore any of the missing content at this time. New from Eddie Lee Wise and Sons, plus me daughters, you sick of seeing camel toe every time you look down at cockpit. The latest in footwear for the commander who likes something hoofing good for their feet. Only at Lave Station. My, you have got big feet, sir. Senator Dox's Assassin. The author of the two volume biography of Lady Kahina Loren has revealed the true identity of the assassin who was paid to murder the self styled Salome. Known by his codename Besieger, the hitman's real name has remained a closely guarded secret for nearly three years. However, during a live Holovid celebration of the life of his subject, scribbling Senator Drew Wagar explained that he had uncovered a trail of payments, giving the key information he needed. He then named the assassin live on air to the horror of the show's producers, who are now said to be living in fear of their lives. Galnet Digest will not reveal the name of the assassin, as it does not want any late-night visitors. But it can exclusively reveal an address that may be helpful to those seeking to avenge the long-dead Minor Imperial from the PRISM system. The address? The Cupboard Under the Stairs, 4 Privet Drive, Little Whinging, Surrey. The Bathroom Update A spokesperson for the Pilots Federation has insisted that there is no toilet paper drought in the face of ongoing protests from commanders who wish they'd eaten fewer leathery eggs. According to the spokesperson, there is no shortage of toilet paper. The problem is caused by commanders wanting to buy too much of it. However, the spokesperson added, we have no plans to give you more at this time. 
He urged commanders to hold on until the end of the year when something truly amazing will be announced. This is believed to be the arrival of the rumoured bathroom update. The bathroom update is said to include bathroom cabinets in which materials such as toothbrushes and soap can be stored, as well as the welcome addition of showers. As most commanders will admit, going six years without a shower certainly gets you noticed. Most importantly though, the update is believed to include B-Days, which will completely eliminate the need for commanders to wipe and polish, and make them immune to future price fluctuations in the toilet paper futures market. And that's this week's Galnet News. Galnet News, we read the news so you don't have to.